Is the value of early learning still subject to debate, or is the debate about something else? No, it is sadly still subject to debate. How many of you in the audience think we live in the greatest country in the world? Raise your hand. Well, we do because of our values and the incredible amount of freedom that we have, uh, unparalleled in, in the face of the planet. But if anybody thinks we're the greatest country in the world because of our achievement, we're not anymore. We used to be, but of the 39 nations that sign on to an international test in science and math for high school students, we finished 21st in math and 27th in science. 21st in math and 27th in science. We don't value education. We say we do, we talk all about it, but we don't value education. Suzanne. Well, maybe uh, the community here at Gladwin Montessori doesn't have to wait until the state decides to do something for the underprivileged children who would like to be in a kindergarten or pre-kindergarten program. I mean, when you think about the plans that we have for ourselves and all the development that we have already done within our school, I think it's time we start thinking about how do we reach out to the larger community beyond Gladwin, beyond our little network of parents and friends. Uh, we have a wealth of teachers here with a lot of experience. And I really think as, um, as, a, as a community here at school, we could begin to think about, well, what can we do to help solve this problem? Montessori for disadvantaged children essentially erases the achievement gap. It's not just, you know, Governor, your point about early childhood is really important. I think we have two things that we have to happen, and I can imagine the level that you're looking at this. One is we've got to get support for, for early childhood. Absolutely. It's got to be universal support for early childhood. The economic case for that is absolutely made. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to get quality early childhood. You know, so let's get early childhood in there first, and then let's get the kind of quality early childhood that makes a profound difference in outcomes. Yeah, that, that's a very important point that uh, the doctor just made. You can't just have essentially glorified childcare. It has to be a rich educational experience. I get how younger students would benefit from being grouped with older students. My three-year-old with someone else's five-year-old, for example, <coughs> and the mentoring that might result. What's in it for the five-year-old? What's in it for the five-year-old? Well, the five-year-old begins to become the teacher for the, t for the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds. So all the skills that he has developed as he's been going through the process, he can now help the younger children, whereas, again, it reinforces the skills that maybe he started to learn and you need a little more practice. It's a great way for children to practice things that they need to learn. I think um, the problem with No Child Left Behind was too much reliance on the test, and secondly, it never gave the states and, and the school districts adequate funding to comply with all the things that was needed. Interestingly, President Bush stood with Ted Kennedy, Democrat, liberal lion. Ted Kennedy was the main sponsor of No Child Left Behind, and it was funded here, and that funding would have been adequate to do some of the things that would have made No Child Left Behind a more positive bill. When the president gave the tax cut, the funding for No Child Left Behind dropped through the floor, mm -hmm. and we never had funding to, to make it work. But you've got to have some form of accountability, and testing should play a role. It shouldn't be dispositive, but it should play a role. How are you able to chart progress? Well, it's, it's, it's part of uh, our training, and also, again, part of Maria, Mo uh, Maria Mas Montessori's philosophy is observation, observation, observation. If you spend a lot of time watching someone, and I, I would suggest maybe you go home and watch one of your boys, you will learn so much about that child that he's, A, he's never going to tell you, and, and B, um, once you learn how the child acts, thinks, supports himself, then you know what his interests are, and then you can get in, you can uh, keep him interested in his work by knowing the child better. So observation get and talking to him, having a conversation about, well, you know, let's sit down and I want you to talk to me about, I see you have the right answer, but how did you get it? Um, or, um, you know, I see you're stuck on this particular problem, but what's your problem with that? And, and as they explain that, you begin to understand how he thinks. I mean, our children are competitive. The environment may not be a competitive environment, 
but there's a natural competitiveness in, a, in most children. And although we don't encourage it by giving prizes or first place and things like that, it's there. We don't discourage it. We don't encourage it because I think competitiveness is a good thing. I, I think it, it's one of those things that you need to learn to have balance with so you can use it to make yourself a better person. If you don't have any competitiveness, uh, I, I, I think you kind of just kind of slow down. Your, your wheels are spinning, Doctor. Oh, well, what do you yeah, want to add? Sake. So um, let's ask Jeff Bezos if he's competitive. Yeah, he is. Jeff Bezos is unbelievably competitive. He's a, he attributes some of his success with Amazon to his Montessori background. And the let's ask the Google guys if they're competitive. Yeah, they're competitive too. Yeah, it turns out. And let's look at the let's look at the authors of um, the the Innovator's DNA, a, a kind of a business book that was published about two years ago, who identified an overrepresentation of Montessori in the background of executives who had been identified as innovative entrepreneurs. Were those people playing to win? Of course they were. Yeah, three to six. There's continuous assessment going on there. You don't need the test to know if a child has phonological awareness because the materials themselves, the, the child's progression through the materials, tell you, an off, tell you everything you need to know about how they're doing, progressing in their sort of academic skills. But what's, not, what's missing is, is things like saying, well, let's talk about this environment. And do you have a rich program? And there's a rich diversity of opportunity for experience in this program. And let's have people sit in that classroom and say, yeah, it's a good vibe here. There's a good buzz here. This feels like the kind of place that I'd like my kid to go. You know, I'll bet every one of you who did a classroom visit before you came to Gladwin, when, I mean, every one of you who did a classroom visit before you came here it thought, everyone. it must be everyone, yeah. If it's not everyone, it's nearly everyone. It's like, you must have said, wow, man, this feels good. I want a piece of this for my kid. That is actually, that's observable, and, and there are elements that led to that that actually are documentable and quantifiable. We could actually you know, qualify the, the degree to which this is a, one, a world-class Montessori environment, and two, the degree to which it really is things that we know uh, that, that characterize a, a developmental environment.